Secondly, there's another issue with the story that we were talking about. Ooh, okay, right. You see where I'm going? Mm -hmm. There, in regards to her martyrdom, which we'll talk about here in a second, I may be, I, maybe I'm jumping ahead. Should I just wait until we actually speak about the martyrdom to get into this you particular aspect? You want to leave them with a cliffhanger here? Let's leave them with a cliffhanger. Hey, I'm Jordan Burke. And I'm Kristen Priola. And this is Saints and Sages. Where we talk about the wisdom of the saints and how it's relevant for you. And real quick, before we start the show, we got a few announcements. Number one, go out and buy this book, This Present Paradise. It's by, it's by Claire Dwyer. You know where you can get it? Sophia Institute Press. You know yes. where else you can get it? SpiritualDirection.com forward slash shop. You'll be doing yourself a really large favor so that you can learn about St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, of and whom we have discussed before on the show. It's already sold out too, so go and, uh, go and get your copy before it sells out again. The other thing we'd like to tell you about very quickly before we start the show is the, ironically <laughs> enough, Firelight Retreat. You'll see why that's ironic in a second because the story involves fire, but why don't you tell ah, about the retreat? I like that parallel. Yeah, the Silent Retreat is coming up February 20th, 2021. We would love for you to come if you're ages 18 to 35. If you're 17, you're out of luck. If you're 36, you're out of luck. 18 to 35. <laughs> Call us. Okay. Email us, actually. But yeah, definitely sign up online, spiritualdirection.com slash events. We would love to have you. It's a silent retreat, so lots of silence. But we're also going to have some fellowship afterwards. Um, it's at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament, like we said, which is a pilgrimage in and of itself in Hansville, Alabama. So join us. We would love for you to come. Yeah, and if you're listening and you're like, what the heck is a silent retreat? Are we just going to go and not talk to anybody? Yes and no. Basically, you go and you personally as an attendee um experience uh goodness and silence when i but there are going to be speakers so you're going to go and listen to talks the whole thing you're going to be silent the speaker will speak sacraments and it's yeah in mass uh or is there gonna mass? there's gonna be confession for sure mm -hmm. uh and you just reflect in silence on what's being taught about so that's we, what that is yeah very powerful we, yeah for sure jordan i love that you said that we really want to make space for you to have an encounter with the lord and what better opportunity to do that amongst other fellow young adults um, across the world? We yep. actually have people flying in. Yep. So we would love to see you there. Yep. Good times. With that being said, I talked about fire. And I think that means that it's time to get into the story of today's saint. Saint Apollonia. Apollonia. Of Alexandria. I will admit we had to Google check the pronunciation <laughs> of this. And so if someone's like, that's not right. Take it up with Google. Don't take it up with us. And eerily enough. Did I pronounce that right? Eerily. eerily Is that a word? Correct. Yeah, it was right. eerie. Eerily. Eerily. That's right. Jordan looked up the the way that the person announces. I'm struggling. It's your facial expression. Is making me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> it looks I'm like just, your dad. You I'm just like waiting. I'm like, all right, where's this the going? The mouth, it like moved up and down and it was uh, just yeah. a mouth. So if you need to look up Apollonia and how to say that after this podcast, yeah, definitely check that out or not because it was weird. We've already said it like 12 times. So, you so end, his feast day, her feast day, we're talking about she, her feast day is February 9th. She is a third century saint, super early um, saint and born in Alexandria, Egypt, Africa. So that's super cool. She is the patron saint of toothaches and dentists. And we'll get into why that is in the story. Um, but this one is really interesting. Be well, they're all interesting, but this one's particularly interesting because we have basically the only thing we know about her is what was written by St. Dionysus, who was the bishop of Alexandria at the time. And what was written about her was about a paragraph. <laughs> yes, we have very little documented from the church on this saint. <laughs> and, and it is strictly on her martyrdom. It doesn't say, and we can, we can, we'll talk a little bit about there's it. Where speculation. We're, yeah, there's some speculation and some inference, but um, yeah, it's, it's mainly about her martyrdom. And the reason I mentioned that is because when we were comparing notes and we're comparing stories and our resources as we do before we, we go over these shows, um, one of the things that we found, which was super interesting, was that artist renderings of St. Apollonia, there's, there's an issue with them. And the issue- Supposedly. Supposedly. According to what was written, according to how she was described, it's believed the, the the common teaching is that she was an older woman, potentially a widow, possibly consecrated either after being a widow or prior, or I guess you can be consecrated prior to being a widow, but consecrated or a widow and then consecrated. Does that make sense? I got you. I'm following. This is uh, this one's tough. Um, so there is that. Uh, and what basically we're finding out is that, or the as the story goes, because 
she was older. Artists didn't want to paint her older. They wanted to like paint her in her size the story, mm. and so they started painting her younger. Okay, and you might be thinking, Jordan, why the heck are you talking about that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, Jordan, let us know what's going on. <laughs> because history is important. And then secondly, there's another issue with the story that we were talking about. Ooh, okay, right. You see where I'm going? Mm -hmm. There, in regards to her martyrdom, which we'll talk about here in a second, I maybe, I maybe I'm jumping ahead. Should I just wait until we actually speak about the martyrdom to get into this? You particular want to leave them with aspect? a cliffhanger here? Let's leave them with a cliffhanger. All let's right. let's go more into the story, and then we'll we'll carry on. So keep in mind the artist renderings of her younger probably is not correct, um, and then that's going to carry on. So. So a little back history. Yeah. We've got Emperor Philip the Arabian, and he was reigning 244 to 249. And there were actually a group of martyrs at that time yep. because they were under persecution from him. He was not a fan of the Christians. There was a pagan prophecy apparently that occurred and was claimed by a poet. And that poet really stirred up everything because the people became really against Christians after that prophecy was claimed. So the emperor was like, off with their heads, you know, pretty much. He didn't say that, but he was, there was a huge wanting to kill them all. Persecution. Huge persecution. Yeah. And the uprise occurred almost immediately people were dying left and right and fleeing the city except for a couple of holy christians who were yep. remaining there and standing their ground and one of them was apollonia mm -hmm. so ba this is where we get into the martyrdom so again this is written directly recorded or it was written by saint dionysus so again who was the bishop of alexandria at the time this is his writing he mentions two martyrs prior to apollonia and in the mentioning of them he kind of writes about how um, they were, I don't necessarily know if wealthy was the term. They were, they were Christians of high standing, I guess Educated, we could probably, probably say. Yep, possibly. So he writes, and I'm just going to outright read it here. At that time, Apollonia, most likely, and then it has a Latin, which I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce, most likely meaning deaconess is what we're getting at, was held in high esteem. These men, this crowd, these, these pagans who were, who were persecuting the Christians, these men seized her and by repeated blows broke all her teeth. Then they then erected outside the city gates a pile of wood and threatened to burn her alive if she refused to repeat after them impious words, either blasphemy against Christ or an invocation of the heathen gods. Given at her own request a little freedom, she sprang quickly into the fire and was burned to death. So we have a lot to break down there. Right. So <laughs> this is where I was getting at with the other historical potential misrepresentation and i say potential because this isn't 100 percent fact this is just what we can determine based on what was written so you can imagine the upheaval that was occurring in this city yeah because once that attack was launched and they were all like exterminate the christians we don't want these people here people were probably scurrying i mean it was probably loud bloody crazy hectic you know and she was threatened to be mm -hmm. killed if she did not say and, and two people just directly prior to her were martyred right and that's written down in the same writing prior to what i just read i just didn't get the whole thing I, yes. just for sake of time yeah and you just read the bishop of alexandria and he was bishop 247 and 265 yes yeah. saint dionysius and so he was actually writing a letter i, j I actually forgot I, I wrote that down and it's um a letter to fabius mm -hmm. who was bishop of antioch mm -hmm. when he was explaining to him what was going on and it was preserved in what is called the eusebius's historia ecclesiae which is just an early church document of the first to fourth century. So that's where we found this this writing. Yep. But anyway, there's upheaval and everybody's going crazy. And they're like, you have to say blasphemies against your God. Yeah. Or you can pretty much bow down and worship the 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 pagan gods and she paused at least this is what is written in legend to A pause after having her teeth knocked out. Oh yeah, out. yeah. So yeah, so that's what, sorry. That, so that's that, the part we're pausing for. Yeah, so this is where I was talking about the historical representation in the painting. So we're tying this together now. I apologize if this was really scattered. Um, there is a lot of reports that say that her teeth were pulled out by torture. I am always of the mindset, especially if you look at scripture, for instance, every word of scripture was very purposely and particularly chosen. Like every word. I think it's the same with this. I personally believe Again, doesn't mean it's fact, but this is my belief that if St. Dionysus, bishop at the time, w would have wrote, they pulled out her teeth or they tortured her in this way. But he very clearly said by repeated blows, which is a very specific wording, repeated blows, broke all of her teeth, 
Why is that important? Again, it's just, we're trying to give you the most historically accurate context of, of these saints. And there's a lot of stories that we both read that said her teeth were pulled out and with like pinchers the, and then there's a lot of paintings that show her with pinchers, with the pinchers. holding teeth yeah so t i guess the question is is that problematic I, I don't think so i don't think so i don't think it's historically accurate but i don't think it's problematic either way she had her teeth yanked or blown punched you yep. know or shattered out yep. of her mouth which is excruciating yep. and so after that blow of her teeth coming out of her mouth they you know asked her again you know to to say these blasphemy blasphemy bla uh, words blasphemies against god and she said no that she wouldn't and so she actually i i read somewhere that she paused and they all yeah. thought she was gonna finally yeah, so I read say that it as well but then she actually jumped into the flames because they had built up a fire mm -hmm. they were building up a fire throwing in all the logs and everything because they were ready to burn her alive yep and so as they had killed others prior to like they were already like burning. i said there was two other christians that saint dionysus writes about directly prior to Ap saint apollonia who were martyred right after this so context is they just murdered two of her friends potentially her friends i'm assuming so because clearly this bishop knew them all by name and you know is, is writing about it real talk i want to know what that prophet said that pagan <laughs> prophet my goodness what was he writing on poetry wise all these people dying and so this leads us to the second part of of this kind of breakdown that needs to be touched of her on. martyrdom yeah because you might be hearing this and say well wait a minute, wait a minute. isn't that suicide now she threw herself into the flames yeah, so you're like wait and now it gets complicated and I, as if this wasn't complicated anyway <laughs> here's the deal folks we, there's a couple things that we have to take into account. One of them is the bishop's writings. And nowhere in the bishop's writings does he condemn her actions. Nowhere. And that, to me, is a huge indication of this not being a, hey, you did wrong, you committed suicide. It's just a reflection of her story. And then later, St. Augustine actually writes about this in his book, The City of God, which, by the way, if Augustine is incredible. I can't wait until we do an episode on him. So bear with me as I read this because I I don't dare try to uh, like put in a nutshell his words. <laughs> and if you've ever read Confessions, he's a beautiful writer. City of God is a little bit harder to get through. <laughs> so, Did you attempt it? Well, no. I mean, you can. The, oh, the, we're talking about his this writing paragraph. style is very different in each yeah, book. Yeah. So what does he say? So he says, but they say during the time of persecution, certain holy women plunged into the water with the intention of being swept away by the waves and drowned and thus preserved their threatened chastity. Pause. As we said, she was most likely a consecrated virgin or in some way had committed herself to the church. We know that to be true. I, either through whatever a deaconess means at that time or through consecrated life, right? Okay. And people were apparently doing heinous acts Precisely. towards Christians. So back to the back to Augustine. Although they quitted life in this wise, nevertheless, they receive high honor as martyrs in the Catholic Church, and their feasts are observed with great ceremony. This is a matter on which I do not pass judgment lightly, for I know not but that the Church was divinely authorized through trustworthy revelations to honor thus the memory of these Christians. It may be that such is the case. May it not be too that these acted in such a manner, not through human capricious, uh, I, I swear I'm not saying that right, but on the command of God, not erroneously, but through obedience, as we must believe in the case of Samson. When, however, God gives a command and makes it clearly known who would account obedience there to a crime or condemn such pious devotion and ready service. I, the, I, I'm sorry if that was really complicated. And, and I don't like condensing his words, which is why I gave you all of them. And I even hesitate to say, essentially, he's saying, but essentially, he's saying... <laughs> She's fine. Well, because even St. Augustine speculated on this. And yeah. you might be wondering, like, why does the church declare this woman a saint if she threw herself into the flames? Yeah. Well, let's look at the preface of the situation. She was asked to say blasphemies against God or to worship the heretical gods. And so in that moment's time, she had an, an option. You know, do I jump into this fire? Are they going to throw me into the fire? What if God inspired her to do so? Which we don't know. There yeah. are accounts of people who said that her actual body was glowing with 
what they believe the fire of the Holy Spirit within her was brighter than the fire itself, which I don't know exactly what that means, but you can imagine just like her inner body glowing too. And so these accounts are written down. The church has verified she is a saint. It is declared this was of the past. And we can note too, it was Mm pre-congregation, which I didn't know what that was prior to reading about this saint. Jordan, did you know what pre-congregation meant? I, I had a brief understanding of it. You actually have a better understanding than I, I do because I was trying to stumble and bumble my way through it when we were talking about St. Lucy, and I just couldn't. I couldn't even remember the word pre-congregation. So that tells you how much I know about it. <laughs> yeah, but, there's but a lot you know, to it. <laughs> you know, you have a good grasp of it. Only a little bit. I just, I looked it up because I was curious, what does this mean? She's pre-congregation. Why is this an important, um, you know, requirement to, to state? So it means that, before there was an extensive process to become declared a saint through the Catholic Church, Saint Apollonia was canonized through Mm -hmm. the Catholic Church. So currently we have what is called the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. Now, first I wanna note that there are more Christians in heaven than are declared saints that have been officially canonized by the church. So there are tons of people who are with Jesus right now who are not declared saints as an example blessed Pierre giorgio yes right we know and this is one of the ones that's easiest to explain his body is incorrupt or it's either un i forgot the two different things but they it's incorrupted i think is the correct um and he's a blessed right so he's going there he's going through the process but hasn't officially been confirmed but it's we can easily say safely assume he is with Christ in heaven. So that's kind of an example. Yeah. And speaking of that, there are three steps to sainthood, venerable, blessed, and then saint, of course. And I don't know if I'm going to go into exactly what all of those are unless you wanted me to. I, Jordan. I think you should. You think I should? Yeah, okay. We got time. Well, prior to that, I want to back up a little bit. The congregation is actually a congregation. So there are people who include recommendations to the Pope on beatifications, canonizations, and they want it to be authorized. Like, all right clearly this person was very devout very holy they were a servant of god and so let's go into their life story and see let's navigate what did they do in their life now you cannot even be you know put on the the table for the congregation to be reviewed their life history until five years after death Mm. um and that's just so feelings can kind of get out of the way you know there, there could be a lot of hype after someone dies especially just you know feeling really close to them and like maybe yeah. they're a little holier than they actually were i don't know i guess that's why and so there are the three steps we've got venerable so the title is given to a deceased person recognized formally by the pope as having lived a heroically virtuous life venerable fulton sheen yeah or offered their life and so the beatification to become blessed which is the next one is one miracle acquired through the candidate's intercession is required in addition to recognition of heroic virtue or offering of their life so the first miracle. So I must said, be blessed Pierre Giorgio, and we also have more recently, blessed Carlo, Carlo Acutis. Acutis. Yep, exactly. Yes. So another example. So then the canonization to become a saint, which is the third step, is the formal process by which the church declares a person to be a saint and worthy of universal veneration. And that actually, you have to have a second miracle uh, occur. And those, real quickly, I, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, those are like, heavily investigated very investigated i think we touched on it like scientifically saint edith uh not edith stein who was the teacher i apologize teacher say elizabeth ann seaton like teacher she elizabeth was a teacher ann seaton. That's, yes that's the one i'm you, almost Maggie. certain we we touched on it with her probably so because there was a a modern uh, you know oh unquote, a scientist modern, you try to figure it out yeah uh, well there was a modern miracle and he talked about the process like Rome was calling investigators from Rome were calling him and they're calling his doctors and they're yeah, doing bringing all those the sorts of things. <laughs> it is and it is when we say like it is an in-depth intense they basically have to go in and, and disprove any other potential option and so and you can imagine how how uh, long that might take yeah and that's the cool part about the church that we can trust and that we have verified people who are really working hard to discover is this person with our Lord yeah and I love that we are not just haphazardly being like, they're a saint. Yep, stamp them. You yeah. know, it's yeah. very, it's just very thoughtful. Yeah. Um, so the three stages, and I'll, I'll end here. 
Stage one is examining the life of a candidate for sainthood, like we mentioned. Stage two, beatification. And stage three, canonization, to say it in a nutshell. So we're talking about St. Apollonia, Apollonia. um, pre-congregation. Apollonia. Apollonia. Um, She's beautiful. She was not declared a saint through the congregation of the causes of saints, but it was before it even existed. So there are popes that talk about, you know, pre-congregation and how it came about and just the different writings that occur just so that we have more, I don't know, kind of more of a grasp of pre-congregation and what that actually was. And you guys can read up on those if yeah. you'd like. And then the question becomes, does that mean that they're less of a saint? No. The answer is absolutely not. It's no. just, you just trust in the church and it's a process. I mean, we probably have a better, we might have a better process now, but we also don't know what happened pre-congregation with those particular instances of beatification. We're, we weren't involved and we just we just don't know. And it's really not any use trying to decipher, quite honestly. Speculating yeah. all that jazz. Yep. Uh, you had some interesting notes on martyrdom. Would you like to touch on that? I mean, just a little bit. So I almost wrote more and I started doing research, but it started getting kind of complicated and I was like, I don't know if we have time for this. But martyrdom is just an interesting declaration for the certain saints. The church does say that there are people who were martyred and we have a process for that too. Um, But I just want to read this quote. The Christian martyr does not die out of hatred of the enemy as a soldier might, but out of love for his killers as Jesus taught and lived in Matthew 5, 43 through 48. No man has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And that's John 15, 13. But for the Christian, our enemies are also our friends as long as their conversion is possible. And that was Father Peter Joseph. And I just wanted to say, you know, it can be kind of confusing um, how we end up declaring someone a martyr versus not, you know, whether it's white martyrdom. And that's a process too. That's a process too. And it is extensive. And so you guys can go in and research about that if you're curious about more. But I, we just want you guys to know that you can have confidence and trust the Holy Catholic Church. You can trust that there are people who really want to discover whether these people were actually martyrs. And there are there are requirements there are stipulations to to claim someone a martyr you can't just like say i believe in jesus and then like die and then they're like oh they're a martyr for the faith I, well that's I, what the world wants us to believe right and, and there's this weird and I, I i don't want to go off on a rant but there's this weird thing going around too where people are like oh, i'm ready to be a martyr and i'm gonna go do this it's like well listen there is an actual process to declaring martyrdom and one of the stipulations is you don't you know maybe i'm getting too complicated but I don't, th- basically what I'm saying is this whole goofy idea of I'm going to go purposely put myself in danger so I can become a martyr. Oh, no, no, no. That's not how it works. No. So don't do that. It's foolish. It's um, really foolish. Yeah, so don't do that. That's all I'm saying. Because like, I've heard that a few times. Right. I'm like, that's actually, the process doesn't allow that. <laughs> so, no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, okay, think about, for example, maybe kamikazes. If you want to give an example of like other um, religions who purposely ask their um, people to to fly and kill themselves and kill other people that's not martyrdom yeah i don't necessarily think that was religion but yeah i understand i get where you're going with that um, it could be tied to religious things but yeah maybe more historically more. yeah that's a that'd be a fascinating conversation those guys were high off their their minds um historically speaking <laughs> lots of, lots of drugs before they they committed the uh the bombings but yeah i do i do understand what you're saying it's still an apt comparison in that way where it's they're dying for either a um some ideal basically and it's like success no, yeah victory it's like no that that's, kind of that's thing. not martyrdom so. whereas jesus teaches that we lay down one's life for one's friends and out of love for our lord that is how one is declared a martyr for the church yeah yeah so saint apollonia has a lot there. It's very simple. She's a simple saint, in my opinion, after researching uh, simply what happened, her story. But if you ever see pictures with a woman um, with Holding pinchers, pinchers and a tooth. you will know. And if you're headed to the dentist, my dad's a dentist, by the way, um, you can ask for her intercession that everything goes well, um, that your teeth don't get knocked out. <laughs> yeah, I guess the, I guess it shows the Catholic Church has a bit of a sense of humor. Her teeth were knocked out, and now she's the patron saint of probably so. That is pretty aches. humorous. But um, yeah, well, now you have a fun party trick too. If you're ever in a, a museum and you see her, and you're like, she was probably older than what they're depicting in the painting. <laughs> you sound really smart. So 
that being said or you sound like a crazy person i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see how many people believe you. Just go, Saints and Sages said it. Yeah, oh, Saints, yeah. Saints, they're totally reliable. <laughs> right, yeah. Really verified yeah, there. <laughs> yeah. That being said, St. Apollonia. Pray for us. Pray for us. Bye, y'all. Bye.